All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to uh, this uh, now eighth annual, which is kind of hard for me to get my mind around, uh, Humanities Undergraduate Symposium. Uh, I'm Matt Wickman. Uh, I'm the director of the Humanities Center, uh, and I'm a professor of English here at BYU. Um, it, is a, it is always a kind of a right of fall now, uh, a real joy for us to hold this uh, symposium. Um, a, a, a couple things about this uh, by way of setup. Uh, the Humanities Center is in its ninth year. This is our eighth annual symposium for our second year forward. Um, many people who uh, work at universities know what Humanities Centers are, but students often don't, their parents often don't. I know I get phone calls <laughs> you know, thinking Humanities Center is some kind of a switchboard for other humanities entities on campus. A Humanities Center is a research center. And because it's a research center, it tends to be sort of focused around the interests of faculty, their specializations, it's like a lab for faculty in the areas of language and literature and culture and philosophy and other humanities fields, art history and others. Um, and when the center was first created by uh, the former dean, uh, John Rosenberg, the center was imagined as a place where faculty would go to get their work done kind of separate from the classroom. Uh, but it didn't take us long to realize that some of the best intellectual assets on campus are our really bright undergraduate students. So we thought, why not find ways, various ways, to integrate students into the intellectual life of our humanities center? Um, and this symposium presents one of the ways that we try to do that. Um, it's, it's always such a joy uh, to hear the wonderful presentations from our really bright undergraduates who are the recipients of humanities grants uh, from the college and university. Uh, and you'll learn more about their projects here really shortly. I need to thank, um, uh, we're several people here. We've always held this uh, in a room uh, live with an audience. Uh, this time around, it's live streamed. Thank you, and we're sorry we didn't cause the pandemic. I um, want to thank all of you who have responded uh, with agility and grace to these conditions. Uh, I need to thank, first of all, Brooke Brown, uh, who is the Humanities Center assistant, who is uh, the, really the uh, person who does everything so extraordinarily well, including getting this up and running, along with Sam Jacob, our uh, wonderful Humanity Center intern, who last year was one of our undergraduate fellows at the Humanity Center. And I want to thank this year's uh, undergraduate fellows. Uh, these are extraordinary students, recognized for their achievement uh, in their majors and disciplines. Um, and they are then, and they're the ones who organized all this. They contacted the, the uh, presenters. They help make the selections and, and, and put together the order of presentations. Uh, and these fellows this year are uh, Pavel Bermudez, uh, Alixa Broby, uh, Brenna Gang, Abby Thatcher, and Jacob Wright. They will introduce themselves to you briefly and also our presenters as they get to speak. Let me just thank everybody right now uh, for being part of this, for watching in. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, and please enjoy this uh, Humanities Undergraduate Symposium. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brenna Gang. I am a double major in philosophy and classical studies and minoring in art. This is my fourth year at UAU. Today, I am presenting Claire Gillette. Um, she is a senior studying in English with plans to pursue graduate studies in folklore next year. She is particularly interested in the folk art customs and material culture of Eastern Canada. She also has a background in radio production, working at BYU Radio for the past year and a half. And it was the combination of these interests that led her to apply for this humanities grant. After she has done the school, she hopes to work either as a professor or a public folklorist to celebrate expressive culture and to champion um, underrepresented voices. Uh, her presentation today is the Folkwave Podcast, Preserving and Perpetuating Fiber Art Traditions, Canadian Fiber Art Traditions um, Through Digital Storytelling. Everybody, 
good to be here. by the importance um, of, of celebrating and preserving these, these textile art customs. Um, so that led to this project that I've been working on. Um, Folkway is it's an ongoing narrative um, podcast series that really is, is meant to highlight um, these, these artists and these important um, customs and traditions. The podcast itself is drawn from interviews, from oral history interviews that I've conducted over the past little while. Um, and the purpose of it really is to, to, to help people know about and um, perpetuate um, these customs. And I should, I should mention that Anna is a quilter, but quilting is by no means the only fiber art that happens in Atlanta, Canada. Um, rug hooking and knitting and crocheting and weaving are also really, really important parts of the culture and the history of the area. Um, so I, I'm going to play a few clips from the first episode, it's the quilting episode, but before I do, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the... ...their studios, but because of coronavirus, plans changed, but I've just been conducting which has actually been, been working really well. Um, and along with compiling these interviews and editing them down into
started, I wanted to make a quilt for them. And I, I really had no experience. We didn't have books. We didn't have online tutorials. We didn't, well, we didn't even have online back then when I started. So there wasn't a whole lot of things to help me out. Um, the only experience I have with sewing machines is I learned to sew when I was in grade 10 in home economics, and I loved it. I loved that creativity part of it. But then when I decided... and then cutting it up and seeing it become something better than I even imagined in my head what it would look like. So that, that was a moment that I remember having that moment and, and then making that decision. This turn. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit on this next clip. Is she's kind of describing the, the feeling in um, these, these quilting guild meetings. Or, Anna describes the feeling in guild meetings really fondly. For her, they are a chance to share ideas and see incredible works of art, but I think most importantly, they are a chance to build and maintain friendships. <laughs> we don't stop talking. <laughs> um, we're chatty, chatty, chatty. Usually it's between 40 to 60 of us that get to a meeting, um, depending on the time of year, depending on the garden, depending on the grandkids, depending on the, the weather. Um, but uh, we have wonderful conversations and uh, we take care of the business portion and then when the show and tell comes, we have a big netting, um, piece of netting, big netting that goes, it's hung from a wall and you close pin if you want to display your quilts that you're talking about. And it just amazes us what people will create. You know, it just, it, it, some, some are from workshops, some are from books, some are a memory kind of thing, or from a photograph. Um, they, uh, most of them will not call themselves fabric artists, because they think that's the artsy part of quilting, that is a separate category. But some just do beautiful piecework that is stunning in its own way. And then how they quilt it, it's either by machine or by hand, but, or, and some do a lot of embellishing, embroideries and beading, beading, and uh, just amazing work that way, the patience that goes into that. But um, it's fun. One of the I'm going to play um, is toward the end of the episode where Anna's talking about some of the commission work that she does. Along with being a part of this guild, she also um, will make memory quilts for people, um, for people's family members who have passed away, and she'll explain that a little bit more. Okay. It's also acutely aware of the role that quilting plays in uniting generations. People from around Canada frequently commission her to make memory quilts blankets pieced from the clothing and belongings of loved ones. They don't always coincide with death, oftentimes their graduation presents, but often they do. They solidify someone's legacy with something concrete, physical, tactile, and Anna gets to be a part of this process. I did a memory quilt back a few years ago for a lady I met at a baby shower, and she said, my husband passed away and he was a carpenter, and would you, do you make memory, can you make a memory quilt out of his clothing? And I said, yeah. I said, 
and bring me down, pick about 25 pieces and put them in a bag and just bring them down to me and we'll go through them. So she brought, one day came down for a drive and, and she just emptied the bags on the living room floor. So we went through them and I said, tell me about this. Well, he was a plaid man, so we had lots of plaid shirts. And he wasn't a dress up man, he, uh, I think he had one sports jacket. And so I said, okay, pick up 25 and I will pick at least 20 to put in the quilt. And so one of the things that I did was because he was a carpenter and because I wasn't able to use all the fabric as a, its own little block, um, I took, I think it was four different fabrics and I cut out shapes of the tools to fit like a uh, 12 or 14 inch block, whatever size I was doing. And so there was a, a hammer and a saw and a screwdriver and I put those on like a collage on one block. So, and I put his, I always use, I tried to put the name, their names on them if I can, if the, if the family wants it. So that's what I did anyway. And she, again, she wanted to give it to her daughter, their, their only child, for Christmas. So I had it done for her. And she called and she said, my daughter was so appreciative of this memory that she feels that her dad is wrapped, wrapping his arms around her when she wears, you know, uses that coat to cuddle with. When I was making the quilt, even though I never met the man, I don't even know what he looks like, just that he was short and kind of stocky, that's the description. And, but I thought about him as I was making the quilt, you know, doing the sewing and piecing together and quilting and all of that. So there's that, but that goes into it too, the thought process. Those are just a few, um, a few of the clips from the, the episode about quilting. Um, in terms of broader distribution, let me see if I can get this going again. Um, in terms of broader distribution, starting in December of this year, the podcast is going to be made available through a, a variety of public outlets. So all those places you can get your podcast, like Apple Podcasts and Spotify and things like that. Um, and it will also be accompanied by a social media presence and then a website as well. And the, the purpose of this really is to try to engage younger audiences. I don't know about you, but as a college student, I listen to quite a few podcasts and I think it's a really helpful medium um, for introducing stories and voices that we might not have access to otherwise. Um, and I, I think that specifically it's important to, um, to reach out to, to Canadians, to young Canadians living in these provinces that might have left for school or work um, so that they know about these traditions and they feel compelled to carry them forward. So yeah, that's, that's the purpose of, of this podcast and I hope when it's more broadly available to all of you can use it. So thank you. either online to someone in the uh, in the audience for Claire. Yeah. Uh, what directed you towards Canadian folklore? And how did you find this uh, group of women all on the South Shore of Nova Scotia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I was a missionary in, in eastern Canada, so that's how I met Anna. She's a member of the church there, but most of the other people that I've talked to are not members of the church. It's mostly just like word of mouth. So I'll ask one person who they know that, that does quilting or knitting or crocheting or things like that. And then, yeah, it kind of just goes from there. It's, it's nice. It's a nice, like, networking kind of, kind of gig. Yeah. Yeah, do you have a question? Do you have any particular attachment to the, uh, the cyber arts? Do you participate much in that yourself? Yeah, I am definitely a novice in every single one. I think that I, uh, I get too excited about the variety of them, and so I'll do for a little while and then I'll get distracted and then I'll start reading. So I dabble in all of them, but I'm certainly not an expert in any of them. But yeah, they, they are very important to me. Great, thank you. Thank you, Claire. Yeah.
I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Pavel Bermudez. I am also one of the undergraduate fellows here at the Humanities Center. Very grateful for that opportunity. Uh, but I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Luisa Bailey. Uh, Luisa is a senior graduating in December with a degree in interdisciplinary humanities with a media arts emphasis. Uh, Luisa works as an assistant producer at BYU Radio, as well as a teaching assistant in Russian literature. Eventually attend film school. In her free time, Luisa likes to watch stand-up comedy, woodwork, and read Slavic literature. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I don't really know. Uh, have to, okay, Sam got the go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna try to figure out how to share my screen with you in the right screen. Okay. Um, okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, just a little PowerPoint. Um, okay, uh, just a fun fact Claire is actually my roommate, typically. Um, I'm not in pro right now, but. Um, I can attest to her love of um, all things um, folk lore, uh, and uh, I uh, also definitely encourage you to listen to that podcast. I'm very excited for it, personally. Um, okay, um, so today I'm talking about um, a project I've done in the last year and a half, roughly, um, and it's been developing um, a, an adaptation um, of uh, a Polish play um, onto, into a screenplay. And so um, I'll just talk a little bit about that process and um, some of the challenges I ran into, and, and mostly I'll be talking about the choices in, in making an adaptation. Um, before I begin, I just want to note that um, the characters I'm going to talk about have really similar names and it can be confusing even to me. Um, so I'm gonna really try to differentiate them, um, but just a heads up in case I, um, in case it's confusing to you. Okay, so um, to begin a conversation about the, this adaptation, we must first establish where it came from and by extension, where we are coming from. We ought to direct our vision to the periphery and tail end of the socialist rule in Eastern Europe specifically to a summer's day in 1984. This is where we begin a film adaptation of this absurd Polish play from the 80s. I initially read it in 2018, and though I struggled to place it precisely, it was obvious to me that there was something hyper-relevant about the conversation Slavomir Mrozik was having. In an effort to explore that conversation, I determined to adapt the play to screen. This is the center of the research and work behind the project. For context, let me lay out the general premise of the play. The landscape of the story is fairly bleak and mundane. Two men happen to find each other in a secluded park, both intending to take their own lives. One of them strikes up a conversation with the other until they are interrupted by a third party, a woman. The bleakness of the moment is overwhelmed by something a little more fruitful, the encounter between sucks and unsucks, the principles of our story. The rest of the play is narratively simple, even uninteresting. They try to win her over, but really the bulk of the play is just a series of conversations between the, these three characters about self-perception and worldviews. It remains unclear by the end what happens to these two men. Mrozek leaves it all rather ambiguous. My attempt at adapting this narrative resulted in a 60 plus page script that was terribly faithful, emphasis on the terribly. The dialogue was nearly word for word. The setting was an extremely similar, but vaguely from but vaguely contemporary locale, and the characters were safely implanted in the play, relatively unchanged. Much of the translation was simply a transcription. I translated stage directions into shots and editing notes. I changed the formatting to adhere to standard screenwriting. The result was a flat screenplay. Anything compelling about the new text was only due to, to Morozhek's brilliant original. It was an almost word-for-word -word translation of the original text and was painfully boring. I couldn't quite understand where I'd gone wrong. Fidelity had always been, been championed when I thought of film and literary adaptations. I circled around the text for a while. I played with more modern dialogue. I made all the characters female, then all male, then tried new combinations. Sucks as a woman, unsucks as a man, and the third character as a ghost. Though none of those choices are problematic in their own right, there was no substance behind them. 
I was nearly ready to scrap the project when a mentor of mine, Dr. Purvis in the Russian department, challenged the intentions behind the entire project. He asked at every opportunity, what are you gonna change? Or some days more bluntly, what's the point? I didn't really know. In an effort to answer his question, I turned to academic roots. Rather than aiming for a seamless adaptation onto the screen, I anchored my efforts in what might be called an additive adaptation. Though it may seem counterintuitive to respect during honoring, celebrating, et cetera, the original text, an additive adaptation continues the conversation the author has begun, not just repeats it. So I shifted my focus from saying the same thing that Mrojek did to saying something new, or perhaps in a new way. And in the spring of this year, I saw an opportunity. In response to a stay-at-home order, a house full of quarantine roommates, in a national, even global sense of uncertainty, I discovered the point. The adaptation was to center on the encounters of the play. Today, I'll remark on a few major changes to the original text and their efforts to add to Mrojek's conversation. The first notable shift is the title of the film, Unsucks. This change in title is meant as a mechanism to direct the viewer towards the inherent connection between the two characters. Rather than, than the emphasis being on the place and time of the play, this may have been more useful in the original stage setting, the emphasis is on the characters. The title points us visually, almost semiotically, to the simultaneous connection and conflict between our leads. This connection is central to the questions we as filmmakers are interested in raising in conjunction with Mrojek. These men are opposites, not just in name. Unsucks is obsessed with his unlucky lot in life. He can't do anything, can't get anything, never succeeds, and isn't worth a thing. Sucks, on the other hand, is exhausted by his constant success. He can do anything, be anything, and have anything. In their literal opposition, these men are confronted with one another in their most critical and lonely moment, only to find their extreme no longer holds up when they're not alone. The narrative has a peculiar structure and the title shift is meant to reflect that. The urgency of the opening situation, two men prepared to commit suicide, gives a slightly warped picture of what is to come. Initially, the stakes are high. Lives are ostensibly on the line, but they are relieved awfully quickly. Only 10 of 60 pages of the story elapse before they seem to abandon their suicidal determinations. For as Unsex puts it, this is an activity meant to be done in private. This privacy is impossible as the two fates of, of, as the fates of the two men fold into each other. As they begin talking, a new tension arises. It is the tension between these two extremes that we find the rising conflict of our adaptation. Though much of the dialogue circles around ideas that are metaphysical and ephemeral, the narrative continually points to the necessity of confronting and reconciling with the real tension that exists in the presence of difference. So we become invested in the differences between these two men. Herein lies the motivation behind the change in title. Using the brackets as a, as a grammatical and semiotic tool, we suggest the interconnectivity and also the clear addition we are making to the text. Brackets are typically used to note something the speaker or author did not originally include, something extra textual. So we emphasize these, these additions we are making to the text and draw attention to the dynamics of these two characters. Unsucks his obsession with his own supposedly predetermined failure, failure and failings would aggravate even the most sympathetic of us. His insecurity seeps into every line of dialogue and his every glance others for attention. He does not make statements to Sucks, but he asks doltish, expectant questions and engages in exclusively one-sided dialogue for the better part of five pages. However annoying Unsucks' antics might be, one cannot fault him for lack of engagement. Unsucks desperately wants the, for the inclusion of someone in his story. Despite his impending suicide, Unsucks jumps at the opportunity to engage with another. He even wants to make his suicide into a murder, which, however dark, is indicative of Unsucks' willingness to engage with another and be part of some kind of collective experience. Once his counterpart is involved, Unsucks becomes more reactionary, asking questions and seeking clarification about what he ought to be doing. Though Unsucks may not accept every proposition made by Sucks, his eagerness to engage with him is indicative of something positive from Rojek. Through his willingness to engage with someone else, Unsucks softens and is able to change throughout the course of the play. Unsucks invites the inclusion of another. He sees and invites connection where Sucks does not. Sucks is equally consumed with himself, but unlike his uh, partner, he refuses to tr truly turn outward. He takes no notice of the man preparing his noose when he enters the stage. 
he seems to have himself unsucks and the whole of the world around him to be sorted out. He understood everything perfectly and speaks with an arrogance that is only matched by unsucks' insecurity. He instructs unsucks on what to do and seems to hold himself in high esteem, claiming that he has even more right to suicide and more reasons for it. He has not the slightest doubt in any of his intellectual determination. Sucks takes no issue in pointing out that unsucks is simply wrong in more ways than one. Eventually, when the lady enters the stage, he feigns that he doesn't even see her pass. Sucks speaks in certainties and absolutes. And he, he's immovable in his opinions. This marks, marks a significant difference between these two men and one we want to pull out. Sucks is unwilling to engage on anyone's terms but his own. So perhaps the brackets are of Sucks's doing, ensuring that there are conditions to his connection with the, to another, setting his own terms of engagement. Though it is a simple enough title, a clever combination of the two characters' names, it draws in the viewer or reader to, into the real progress of the narrative. That is what is happening between these two men. This is where Unsucks triumphs. He may be swallowed up with his insecurities and failures, but his readiness to engage with the others around him open him up to the opportunity for love and more importantly, change. To move from his extreme position to something a little more moderate. By the end of the play, Unsucks is swimming, something that he could, not, he could not only not do at the beginning of the play, but something that led him to believe he had some fault or something missing. His engagement with both Sucks and the third character propel him to try it after all and approach the completely unknown experience that once caused him sorrow and fear. However eager and reductive unsucks might be, his eagerness to look somewhere other than himself, or more accurately, include others in his perception of self and the world, results in a growth that escapes his counterpart. Unsucks sees what is so obvious to us as would-be audience members. Despite the differences between the two of them, of them, they are simply variations on a theme. Even their names contain one another. Unsucks, rather than remaining the binary that his name and circumstance suggest, moves towards moderation, towards understanding. The next ma major change was the change in setting. We moved the action of the narrative from a post-war, pre-democracy Poland to today, here now in Provo, Utah, the winter of 2020, in the middle of a global pandemic. It may sound far-fetched, or if not far-fetched, just a little arbitrary. However, the relation between these two times and places might not be as disparate as we imagine. A Summer's Day was originally written by the prolific satirist, playwright, and cartoonist Slavomir Mrozik. Mrozik himself was not unfamiliar with questions of self versus other as a political exile of his homeland, Poland. Poland and its people were on the verge of change in 1984. Poland established democracy just one year later in 1985. Under the weighty problems brought about by post-war socialism, the, Pol the Polish people were confronting the complicated realities they, exist they existed within and then looking to change course. From invasions, occupations, and other political campaigns, most significantly, significantly the fresh wounds of World War II, Poland struggled to build a national identity. Here we find a reflection and an opportunity. As we consider the similar challenges facing characters in both settings, we're able to use this change as an amplifier to the questions we as filmmakers want to ask. A comparative view of these two times and places reveals some echoes, some familiarity. We see stilted reflections of the reality in which we are living as we consider post, the post-war Eastern Bloc and their state of affairs. Regulated uniforms, political turmoil, divisive rhetoric, and economic uncertainty. Simply put, a general state of unease. In both places, a question hangs over a nation and its people. What comes next? When considering these ideas and characters in light of Mrozek's background in the political and social state of Poland at the time of the original, we see them reverberate through that time and place. A relatively new socialist nation moving towards democracy and the exiled author writing about it offer a reflection of the questions underpinning the play. How do we deal with otherness in our lives? And as we shift the text from stage to screen, we see another reflection. By setting the story in the Mountain West in the middle of a pandemic, we create an opening for essential conversations in a polarizing time. The basic settings will remain the same, a public park, a cafe, a waterfront, by and large, the film will remain in line with the mostly timeless markers of the original. It's not a heavy handed setting shift. It only requires a few visual indicators to place the film within this specific time. Unsucks pulls out a mask before sitting down to talk to Sucks. When the party sits at the cafe, there are fewer tables, fewer people passing by. 
sucks and unsucks both remove and don their masks in various moments. The mask, its presence, removal, and, and the symbol it carries of the pandemic is a concentrated symbol of the difference of these characters and the work they may or may not do to mediate said differences and to care for others around them. The disparate opinions and interpretations of how to handle a pandemic on an interpersonal level are varied and often in contention. By placing this with narrative within the context of the global pandemic, we're inviting our viewers to attempt the same questions Marjorie did in 1984. How do we deal with complicated differences between ourselves, our in-groups, and all the others in our lives? By setting it subtly in our time and circumstances, we bring all of our baggage. And rather than weigh the adaptation down, it acts as a thematic amplifier for both the characters and the setting, an echo chamber between different times and places, but one that amplifies the decidedly human questions at the heart of the play. In Rojak's original text, the third character that enters the action is a beautiful woman whose name is only given name is Lady. After she literally sweeps through the opening act between sucks and unsucks, most of the remaining narrative is centered on these two men trying to garner her attention in one way or another. Our film changes this dynamic slightly. Rather than using Lady as the object of affection, we use the dog as our third in our as the third in our trio of characters. This may seem an arbitrary change, change but its intentions are specific. First, it removes the opportunity for another unnamed and uninteresting beautiful woman to be not the center of a narrative, but rather the object of the two characters on whom the narrative is centered. Secondly, it changes the desire for these two men to impress and engage with the third from something that is overtly romantic, perhaps even sexual, to something that is a little more subtle, a little more complicated. These men try to get the dog to like them, to choose them. The nuances here might be read a variety of ways, but the overall effect is that the dog starts to blur the differences between sucks and unsucks. Dog becomes a character in which unwittingly the two me other men are required to meet, whatever their motivations might be. The dog has no interest in being wooed, but is simpler, perhaps pure in its relation to any human. By removing romantic or sexual motivation from the picture, we see sucks and unsucks a little more clearly. The whole of this, this adaptation is not particularly avant-garde or absurd in the changes um, made from the source text. Any changes are meant to be subtle, yet the intentions behind each change are ones that embrace the expansion of ideas that occur in the space between stage and screen. Rather than forcing limitations on itself, this adaptation unsucks opens itself up to explore specific and human challenges between both times and circumstances. So with these changes, we as filmmakers are able to take advantage of the reflection between two places, which invite us on a different kind of uncertain day to ask the same questions. That's it. Maybe a question, maybe two. Pavel, are you seeing anything from the chat that you'd like to bring up for questions for, for Luisa? Okay. Well, one question real quick, um, nothing from chat yet. I wanted to ask more about um, the plans. Are there plans to make that screenshot into a movie or, or anything like that? Um, yeah. So uh, we're actually going to do this um, just like at the end of the semester. Um, somewhere between November and December, uh, we have some people who are gonna, yeah, help me, help me make it. Very cool. Questions from the audience? One question I have. Can you, can you hear me, Lisa? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, a little bit, yeah. If not, not sound, repeat it. What, what unexpected, unexpected thing is, is gained gain aesthetically, aesthetically or artistically, artistically by moving from colon to like Provo? Provo. Yeah, um, something I thought a lot about is I thought about just making it kind of like a very vague setting. I think something that's um, kind of interesting about um, the Mountain West, I, I can't speak to Provo so specifically, but I do feel like something about the Mountain West, there's something that feels very middle of the road about it. Um, it's obviously not like in the Midwest, but um, yeah, it feels like a place that is sort of um, able to shift a little bit to to be a lot of other places um, uh, in in the states, um, but also I think I think there was also just something that I felt being here during this specific time um, that felt additive to the adaptation. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, let's give one more round of applause to Luisa. comments or questions um, on the YouTube chat, and we would love to field them for the future presenters. And two, for presenters, please make sure to speak directly into the mic um, as close as possible, because people online are having a bit of a difficult time hearing those that are presenting. Um, I, it's my pleasure to, one, I guess, introduce myself before I forget. My name is Abby Thatcher. I'm an undergraduate fellow with the Humanities Center. I'm a double major studying interdisciplinary humanities and English literature. And it's my pleasure to introduce Jacob Jensen. He is a senior studying art history with an emphasis in the early modern period and in German Renaissance devotional imagery. He is currently applying to PhD programs in art history and plans to work in universities after graduation. Outside of school, he is passionate about food, both cooking and consuming it, and dabbles in art and creative writing. Jacob will be presenting on deification in 16th century German painting, John the Beloved as Alter Christus. Thank you and we'll welcome Jacob. In 16th century Germany, crucifixion images were an especially popular subject for Andachtsbilder, paintings that depict a non-narrative theological concept as an aid for meditation and devotion. Matthias Grunewald painted many of these Andachtsbilder, such as small crucifixion, with figures on which the viewer could meditate and with whom to share experiences. Crucifixion Andachtsbilder typically focus on Jesus Christ's suffering and passion and on Mary's secondary role as co-sufferer and co-redemptrix, giving others, such as St. John the Beloved or Mary Magdalene, a tertiary or further supportive role. In defiance of this tradition, small crucifixion um, places relatively little emphasis on Christ and the Virgin. Rather, St. John is presented as a primary figure and as an altar Christus, or another Christ, a physical embodiment of Christ's wounds, crucified alongside his Savior. Herein, he not, he not only acts as an intermediary saint, but becomes a representation of the living Christ and his redemptive power, replacing, instead of supporting, certain of the roles of Mary and of Jesus Christ himself. In order to fully understand the significance of small crucifixion, one must be acquainted with Grunewald's best known work, the Isenheim altarpiece. The crucifixion panel from Isenheim combines narrative elements such as St. John catching the fainting virgin with non-narrative Andachtsbild imagery, such as Christ as the Lamb, a symbolic triumph, a symbolic, symbolic of the triumph and resurrected Christ who holds a cross while blood pours from its pierced heart to fill a Eucharistic chalice. Christ's role in the Isenheim crucifixion is famous for bearing the symptoms of the skin disease, St. Anthony's fire, or ergotism, which was common among the patrons of the Isenheim hospital for which the painting was commissioned. Christ is naturally the most relatable figure in the painting to an individual afflicted by the disease. Thus, at Isenheim, Christ is presented as the perfect intercessor, a figure who perfectly knows the afflictions of his followers. In small crucifixion, Christ is the largest figure, his arms stretch to abnormal length to remind the viewer of popular early Christian writings about the Passion. For example, Dennis the Carthusian's spiritual writings describes the crucified Christ saying, the weight of his body cruelly bore down upon his limbs, widening his wounds and tearing his nerves asunder. 
Despite being the largest and most dominant figure in the painting, Christ does not attract the viewer's full attention. Instead, the formal composition draws the viewer's eye to Christ and John as a pair. Similarly de-emphasized in the painting is the Virgin Mary. Dressed in green and black instead of her usual blue and red, colors which allude to her compassion and her co-suffering with Christ, she loses one of her most prominent features in devotional imagery. Instead of typing her to the redemptive blood of Christ, Grunewald presents Mary as a type of her lifeless, statue-like son on the cross. This presentation of Christ and Mary as unapproachable figures rather than active intercessors directs, directs the viewer to seek emotional connection and intercession in one of the two other figures, either Mary Magdalene or St. John. Mary Magdalene is dressed in a blood-red garment which seems to flow from the base of the cross, a displaced reference to the blood of Christ, and a fitting symbol for the illustrious penitent. Thus she becomes an easily relatable intercessor for the viewer in seeking salvation through Christ's redemptive blood. However, the painting prioritizes St. John in its formal and theological composition. John stands prominently on Christ's left-hand side, his gaze directed at the side wound. wound. This is traditional in Christian painting, as John is the disciple of whom it is written, But when they came to Jesus, one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. This central role in Johannian theology is emphasized by John's placement alone on the right side of the image, with abundant space surrounding him. Unlike the two Marys who are surrounded by the greens and browns of the midground and background, further supportive evidence for the interpretation of John as the chief intercessor for Christ is found in the obscure liturgical hymn, Verbum Dei Deo Natum. The bridegroom, adorned with a red garment, seen but not comprehended, has returned to his palace. Speak, O loved one of the beloved, what his nature is, and from my beloved announce the message of engagement to the bride so that we may sing with you as our patron before the Lamb, before the throne, praises to heaven. In these lines, John takes on an intercessory role, acting as the bridegroom's herald to the bride, the perfect intercessor between Christ and the church, and stand-in for Christ on a greater scale than many other alter altera Christi. Small Crucifixion engages in a centuries-long discussion on the divine role of John the Evangelist joining the almost unknown tradition of deifying the apostle in contemplative monasteries. While Grunewald was likely unaware of this emerging monastic practice of deification, small crucifixion's elevation of the saint likely stems from the same principles and inspiration that created the cult of St. John and led to this devotional practice. Many spiritual writings encourage disciples to experience Christ's passion for themselves, beginning with St. Paul saying to the Galatians, with Christ I am fastened on the cross. Dennis the Carthusian indicates in the section on Christ's passion in his spiritual writings that readers should meditate on Christ's suffering. The Marian hymn Stabat Mater pleads with Mary to allow the devotee to physically experience the wounds of Christ's passion. Holy Mother, pierce me through, in my heart each wound renew of my Savior crucified. Let me share with thee his pain for all my sins, for who for all my sins was slain, who for me in torments died. Cruc the small crucifixion encourages the devotee to experience the agony of the passion and provides an example in St. John, reflecting a similarity in the rise of both the Marian and Johannian cult. In stepping away from overt emphasis on the Savior, Grunewald provides an altar Christus who fills many of the redemptive roles that are typically portrayed in the crucified Lord. The term altar Christus refers to an individual who acts as a stand-in for Christ. The most traditional altera Christi being priests acting in their sacred offices, such as administering the Eucharist. In addition to priestly altera Christi, there are three other types or levels of altera Christi applicable to the discussion on small crucifixion. They are those who possess an aspect of Christ, such as St. Francis, whose reception of the stigmata made him more physically like Christ, Physical objects that were believed to be able to stand in for Christ and heal and bless believers, such as icons, cult statues, and relics like the sudarium or crown of thorns. 
and the exceptional case of a person receiving God's countenance or likeness fully in their soul, typically only temporarily. The figure of Christ in small crucifixion relates to each of these types of alterity, or uh, Christi. He is alike St. Francis, due to his physical possession of certain of Christ's attributes, transferred in a similar way as to traditional Franciscan imagery. The painted figure functions like an icon or relic as an intercessory object to the saint. John's role as Alter Christus even follows the fourth and rarest type mentioned above, depicting him in a temporary state of transcendence and transfiguration, a physical representation of Christ's identity and role as Savior. In some ways, this connects to the doctrine of transubstantiation, the belief that the Eucharistic host and wine are literally transfigured into the body and blood of Christ. In small crucifixion, John becomes an embodiment of Christ's living sacrifice, a living host transfigured into the body and presence of the living Lord alongside the dead Lord, thus reemphasizing the Catholic tradition of venerating the wafer and the wine as the physical presence of Christ during the Mass. It quickly becomes apparent how John is this fourth type of altar Christus through formal and semiotic analysis. The significance of John and small crucifixion is emphasized by strong formal lines that direct the viewer's attention toward particular symbolic pairings. The strongest lines in the painting are created by the heavy weight of Christ's limbs. The painting directs the viewer's eye from Jesus' contorted right hand down his arm, creating a strong diagonal line that continues to and through John's similarly contorted hands. Additionally, a sharp line is drawn from Jesus' left hand to his feet, John's hands perfectly centered in this second diagonal. Significantly, the diagonal lines that connect John to Christ are also lines that come to the three points of, from the three points of the cross, creating a second cross in the image, albeit an invisible one. Thus, in small crucifixion, John is crucified alongside his Savior. These lines also function similarly to the visible rays portrayed in some images of St. Francis receiving the stigmata, such as Giotto's depiction of the event. In these images, visible rays emit from the wounds in Christ's feet, hands and feet and inflict the wounds of Christ's passion in the hands and feet of St. Francis, depicting the very moment that St. Francis, Francis becomes Altar Christus. This connection between small crucifixion and traditional imagery of St. Francis receiving the stigmata accentuates and emphasizes the role of St. John as Altar Christus functioning in multiple types of the types mentioned above. In addition to formal elements, small crucifixion utilizes color extensively in its demonstration of connections and character significance, which can be described by semiotic analysis. While Mary is typically depicted in blue and red, as seen here, symbolic of her compassion and role as co-redemptrix, small crucifixion places her in a dark green that almost seems to melt into the eclipse darkened sky. Instead of dressing Mary in her traditional colors that remind the viewer of her compassion, small crucifixion applies these colors to John, giving him the role of compassionate co-redeemer. The significance of John's clothing does not stop with its usurpation of Mary's iconography. When the blue and red are viewed alongside his fleshy pink girdle, the clothing connects directly to the body of Christ on the cross and in his passion. The pink robe, with its many torn spots and holes, resembles both Christ's thrashed garment in the painting and also the wounded body of Christ, with its many lacerations from being whipped before the crucifixion, similarly to how Grunewald emphasizes the lacerations in Christ's flesh in the Isenheim crucifixion. Flowing from inside John's torn, fleshy garment are streams of red and blue fabric. The devout viewer would instantly be reminded of the writings that say that from Christ's side, blood and water flowed. This ties in directly to, Christ, to John's typical role as chief witness of Christ's wounding by the spear. Thus, Christ's wounds become the signified, John's clothing the signifier. This connection is only reinforced by John's gaze being directed at the side wound and the otherwise inexplicable lack of gushing blood or water from Christ's side in small crucifixion, as Grunewald depicted it, in the Isenheim crucifixion panel, where the blood flows freely. Small crucifixion uniquely uses a saint who rank, normally ranks significantly lower than Christ and the Virgin as an intermediary and representation of the living and redemptive aspect of Christ and his passion. This depiction likely draws on the tradition in some groups of depicting John as a deified individual, of being already exalted to the station he witnessed in the book of Revelation, which reads, 
To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in his throne. Thus, in small crucifixion, St. John becomes what he sees, transferring to the viewer his own eyewitness of Christ's passion. He is an imaged model for Christ and intercessor on his part, a being who has taken upon himself some of the aspects of the eternal Christ. Thus, St. John the Beloved is seen as the greatest and highest intercessor to Christ, the ultimate and truest of all Terra Christi. Thank you. So I've always been intrigued by Grunewald's work because he does deviate from standard color patterns more often than most artists. He also is one of the, has one of the most uh, gruesome depictions of Christ in the Renaissance or most eras in general. Um, this Christ is very gruesome looking, but the one in Isenheim actually shows the crown of thorns having like a foot long uh, spike that jabs into his shoulder. It's just very gruesome. and so. I was curious why he would choose to do that. And the first thing about this painting specifically that stood out to me was Mary's place at the bottom of the cross. Um, there are other depictions where she is obviously the person standing in for Christ's blood, but usually when they do that, they take away um, red from every other part of the painting to signify that blood being placed somewhere else in the painting. But the fact that it's in two places was really intriguing to me. And it's also, a, it's not a very typical arrangement of saints around Christ. Even though all three of these people were at the actual crucifixion, almost every other image that shows these three also shows other saints around them. So those are a few of the things that stood out to me and made me interested in this one. Yes? You did a really nice job bringing up various features of the composition of the painting. A painting like this, I'm struck by, the, by the, 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 the contrast between the beautiful lines that you show, the diagonals, and with those do to create a second uh, crucifix, that was a very nicely uh, illustrated uh, point of yours. But that on the one hand, which is also clean and lovely, and then the intensity of the suffering of the image, which almost breaks down the cleanness of its composition. Were you struck by that also, or am I seeing something that's not quite there as you, as you look at it? I, I was also struck by that. When I first looked at this, I didn't really see clean compositions. The first thing I just saw, the gruesomeness and the really um, emotional dark colors. But then it was shocking to discover that he had created one of the more organized, formal compositions among German Renaissance paintings. So it is unusual and interesting. And I think he also contrasts it beautifully by having not very clean nature in the background. So it really emphasizes the fact that he's trying to show order and composition in, in God's plan instead of in, um, in the suffering. It's, it's all in the composition and in the circumstances. Hmm. Yes? Um, I really like that you emphasize the hands. Like you pointed out the hands. That was like the first thing that kind of struck me when I saw all of this. Um, is that like characteristic of the specific artist or is it kind of an anomaly? It's actually not. I looked through a bunch of his um, sketches, and there's only about 10 paintings extant from this artist, but there are a lot of sketches that have been collected. And at first I was wondering if it was part of the stereotypical older artists don't know how to paint as well as modern artists, but his sketchings of hands are as intricate and detailed as anyone else's. And so um, when you look at the interesting uh, contortion of John's hands or the strange angling of Mary's hands in a kind of different prayer grasp, those are all obviously very intentional based on his normal style and technique. Thank, Thank you. you.
Hello, my name is Alexa Groby, and I'm a senior studying English, and I have the privilege of introducing Alexandra Carlisle. She's a senior and an art history major from Sandy, Utah. Her research interests center around depictions of pregnancy, childbirth, and the female body in art. Her most recent research revolves around depictions of Christ in his mother's womb. After graduation, Alexandra plans on attending gra graduate school with the eventual goal of becoming a professor. And her presentation is titled, Victim Turned Victor, Marguerite de Navarre as Raphael St. Margaret. versions of St. Margaret and the Dragon from 1518 are, have largely been forgotten by art historians, but comparing and contrasting the paintings brings up important issues of gender and patronage in the Renaissance. These two paintings depict St. Margaret, the patron saint of childbirth. They were commissioned by Pope Leo X as a gift for Marguerite de Navarre, the powerful sister of King Francis I. Due to the similarity in their names, we can directly associate Marguerite with this depiction of St. Margaret. Raphael's use of anatomical birth imagery is consistent across the two images, but his two depictions of St. Margaret are distinct, thus revealing the role of Marguerite de Navarre in French society, both as a powerful woman in politics and as an advocate against sexual assault. As shown in the paintings, Marguerite reframed her experiences with sexual assault to transform herself from victim to victor. Both versions of this painting depict St. Margaret as she has just emerged from the dragon. According to legend, Margaret refuses the sexual advances of a high-ranking pagan who has her tortured and ultimately killed. While in prison, Margaret faces a devil in the form of a dragon. The golden legend states that Margaret makes the sign of the cross and drives the dragon away but vernacular versions say that the dragon swallows Margaret. When she makes the sign of the cross in the dragon's stomach, it bursts open to release her. Like other representations of St. Margaret, Raphael's paintings depict the more apocryphal version in which Margaret is swallowed. Both Raphael's depictions of St. Margaret portray the dragon's open mouth and its sinuous tail using anatomically based imagery. The dragon's mouth references the birth canal, and its tail alludes to an umbilical cord. First, the dragon's mouth opens in a rounded diamond shape, which imitates the widened mouth of the birth canal at the event of birth. Raphael places an unprecedented emphasis on the dragon's open mouth, thereby emphasizing the anatomical reference. Due to new advances in science and anatomy, men like Raphael would have had access to anatomical drawings of the female body and reprodu reproductive system. Specifically, Raphael likely had access to Leonardo da Vinci's sketches of the anatomy of a woman after childbirth. Even if Raphael did not have access to this particular image, however, other similar images were available and well circulated in the medical community. These images depict the opening of the birth canal frontally, with the labia clearly visible on either side. When these anatomical images are compared to the mouth of the dragon in Raphael's St. Margaret, the resemblance in shape and composition is striking. Raphael's reference to the birth canal is therefore consistent with the anatomical images available to him. Raphael's second anatomical reference is to an umbilical cord. In both St. Margaret paintings, the dragon's tail is long and snake-like, ending in a nub. The color varies from cream to brownish green, and the tail is tortuous. This visually references an umbilical cord. Comparing Raphael's St. Margaret paintings to other St. Margaret depictions strengthens this anatomical argument, since compared to other St. Mar Margaret artworks, Raphael's dragons are incredibly serpentine. Significantly, these dragons 
mark a change from Raphael's own previous dragon depictions, as we can see in St. Michael and St. George and the Dragon, both from 1504. These dragons are smaller than their accompanying saints and resemble small dogs more than giant serpents. In contrast, Raphael here makes his dragons large and serpentine to reinforce the umbilical reference and allow for a vaginal passage large enough to deliver St. Margaret. Raphael combines anatomical references with St. Margaret as a subject matter. This creates an aggregation of female and male worlds. Birth in the Renaissance was a complicated gendered space. A man attending a birth had previously been considered unlucky and undesirable. However, men in the Renaissance were becoming increasingly involved in birth through anatomy and as surgeons. These sciences were accessible only to men and were therefore a way for men to enter the female-dominated birth scene. Here, Raphael depicts a traditionally female space but includes anatomical references that, despite being intimately tied to the female body, are created and accessed only by men. St. Margaret's position in a gender-confused space therefore reflects the fluctuating gender roles in the birth process that were changing during the Renaissance. Birth and St. Margaret in particular were traditionally areas of women's domain. St. Margaret was more commonly petitioned by women than by men, particularly during birth. In fact, the vernacular tradition of Margaret being swallowed by the dragon was popularized specifically by women due to its natal implications. In depicting St. Margaret emerging from a dragon, Raphael makes his painting relevant to a female audience familiar with birth. Margaret dominates this painting just as she presides over female birth rituals. Raphael's reference to an umbilical cord is another female-centered image, as many mothers of the time presented their baby's umbilical cord as a votive offering to St. Margaret. With men rarely attending birth, women were the primary viewers of umbilical cords. Raphael's subject matter and reference to an umbilical cord therefore creates a scene of birth familiar specifically to female viewers. This is therefore a feminine space. At the same time, the visual anatomical references specifically bring up fields of science which were decidedly male. Raphael's creation of a dual gendered space relates directly to the intended owner. Marguerite de Navarre, King Francis's sister and close advisor, was a woman fulfilling traditionally masculine roles. Her book, The Heptameron, indicates that she struggled because of her gender and the accompanying societal expectations. With St. Margaret standing in for Marguerite, Pope Leo X indicates that Marguerite is a successful mediator between worlds. This may have been flattery or a genuine compliment to Marguerite's dedication to reform and women's rights. Regardless, the works reveal how Marguerite was viewed as she navigated complicated gendered space. Just as St. Margaret conquers the dragon and rises victorious from the ambiguity of dual gendered space, Marguerite successfully navigated politics as a woman in a male-dominated field. St. Margaret as a subject matter is also a reference to Marguerite de Navarre's role in combating sexual assault. Like St. Margaret, 17-year-old Marguerite rejected unwanted sexual advances, as recounted in the Heptameron. Also related in the Heptameron, in 1516, shortly before Raphael began the St. Margaret paintings, a nun who had been sexually assaulted confided in Marguerite de Navarre, who then sought out justice against the nun's assaulter. In the following years, Marguerite would frame herself as an advocate for women's rights, specifically against sexual assault. Based on Marguerite's self-portrayal in the Heptameron, she assumes two roles related to sexual assault, that of delivered and that of deliverer. Contrasting the two versions of St. Margaret and the Dragon emphasizes Marguerite's role as both victim and salvific figure. By comparing her with St. Margaret, Raphael makes Marguerite a near saint for women of all social classes, a living patron for women in distress. Although the two paintings originated from the same inventive process, important differences exist between the earlier Louvre version, which was given to Marguerite, and the slightly later Vienna version. While both works are compositionally similar and include the important anatomical references, they emphasize different aspects of St. Margaret's story. 
The Louvre piece, which is shown here on the left, depicts Margaret as the innocent mortal victim. She seems unaware of the violence around her as she emerges from the dragon as if she's being born or delivered. In contrast, the Vienna Margaret on the right has the full breasts, rounded thighs, and pinned up hair of a grown woman. She is more of a childbearing age than the teenage Louvre Margaret. This older Margaret carries a weapon-like cross and looks directly at the dragon's open mouth. She is capable and cognizant of both the threat and her post-mortal power over it as a saint. In essence, the Louvre St. Margaret and the Dragon shows St. Margaret as a mortal delivered victim, whereas the Vienna version depicts her as resurrected deliverer. The dual roles of deliverer and delivered are evident also in the legend of St. Margaret. She is both a virgin and the patron saint of childbirth. This creates a tension that, when accompanied by her violent death, insinuates sexual assault. Traditionally, the dragon is a symbol of lust and sexual sin, so Margaret conquering it symbolizes guarding her chastity. Just as Christ delivers Margaret from the dragon, she is delivered from unwanted sexual advances by her death in Christ. She can then intervene for laboring women. Her deliverance from the dragon allows her to deliver other women, just as Marguerite de Navarre's experience with sexual assault allowed her to become an advocate for other assault victims. Margaret's victory over the dragon in these works indicates that sexual assault victims like Marguerite could ultimately triumph over their assaulters and become victorious deliverers. In conclusion, the two versions of Raphael's St. Margaret and the Dragon provide a rich dialogue on fluctuating gender roles in Renaissance society. The painting's anatomical references create a vivid, complex birth scene that allows Raphael to address the complicated role of Marguerite de Navarre as a woman operating in a man's world. The implications of sexual assault and woman's ability to rise above it act as an early version of Marguerite's self-styled role as delivered and deliverer, a woman who could rise above the male oppression of assault to make a difference in the world. Thus, the two versions of Raphael's St. Margaret and the Dragon demonstrate the effects of a changing society in which men could enter female spheres and women could enter male politics. For our modern society, adapting to new concepts of gender in public space these paintings suggest that achieving a balance is an act of salvation and victory for all involved. Thank you. is the Pope would have asked Raphael to make this painting, and in the process of developing it, he came up with two different ideas. Um, so it resulted in two different paintings, and then the Pope picked the one that he liked better, and that was the one that she ended up getting. Yeah. What do you think made Raphael sensitive to the issue of sexual assault? I mean, today in our society, uh, it's a commonly discussed subject, right? Uh, people are aware, there's sensitivity very broadly distributed. Mm -hmm. Was that the case in his society? And if it, if it was, that answers my question, I guess. If it wasn't, what made him somebody able to depict this as sensitively as you illustrated here? Well, I think our society is definitely better at handling assault, obviously. And I'm not sure that it would have been a common topic of discussion in Renaissance society, but with this particular patron, um, it was very important to her, and it's something that she wrote about extensively in her book, and something that um, I think would have been pertinent with the Pope as well, who commissioned these works, because he and Marguerite had worked together pretty closely with some religious reform. So I think it would have been an issue related more to the painting than to the culture involved. Um, I'm not sure why he was able to handle it so sensitively, other than Raphael was spectacular. But, yeah. <laughs> Well, 
Um, to be honest, this isn't something that I've considered in a great deal of depth because I consider the shapes similar enough and both fairly anatomically based. And it could just be a stylistic difference as well. But as far as related to the two different versions of St. Margaret and how they interact with the mouth, I think the widened mouth that we see on the Vienna St. Margaret is considerably more threatening, I would say which relates directly to that St. Margaret's um, feeling of power. I feel like there's a, a great deal of power involved in the Vienna image, whereas the Louvre version is not quite so much. And I think with the Vienna version being later, Raphael was able to develop more of those ideas of assault and attack and violence. And so for that reason, perhaps the mouth is extended more to where it's more of a threat of swallowing Margaret up again. Um, I have the pleasure to uh, introduce Sarah. First, I'll introduce myself. My name is Jacob Wright, and I'm a senior here at BYU. My major is German teaching, and I have a minor in European studies. And now I'll introduce to you Sarah Hill. She is a senior undergraduate here at BYU, and she's studying linguistics with a minor in computational linguistics. She is interested in corpus studies as well as natural language processing. And she is working right now with Dr. Eckstein and Dr. Rollins on related research. After graduation, she plans on attending graduate school for applied linguistics. And the title of her presentation is Authorial Stance Analysis Across Disciplines. Introduction. It's good to be with you guys here today. Um, let's see if we can get this to work. So, as you mentioned, um, I'll be talking about authorial stance analysis across disciplines today. And as undergraduates or former undergraduates, we've all experienced the learning curve of learning how to write in formal academic graduate level uh, papers for each of our disciplines. And I want to ask you a question right now. I want you to think about how you learned how to write in your specific disciplines. And often, the answer to that question is simply observation and practice. And so, what if we could quantify in each individual genre what exactly is different about the formal academic writing? And that's what I wanted to look at, into during this research project with the help of Professor Jacob Robbins. So I'll be going over what authorial stance is, and then I'll go into the methodology of the project and followed by a brief analysis. So authorial stance is the way that writers present themselves, their opinions, and their arguments, and also how they present their cited material. There are four main elements of authorial stance, citation form, cited work, personal pronouns, and recording verbs. And I'll be going into some detail for each of these. So citation form is the manner in which previous studies are cited or the way that the author is incorporated into the sentence. There are two main forms, integral citation and non-integral. Integral, as you can see, we have the author incorporated essentially into the sentence, and there are four ways of doing that. And then we have a non-integral citation, which is just in those parentheses at the end of the sentence. Then we have cited work as the second element. 
and that is the manner in which previous studies are described. We have direct quotations, which is where the writer just takes the exact same words that the cited author used, as you know. And there are three forms of that, as you can see here. And then we have summaries, and then generalizations are just two or more sources of, uh, or a summary with two or more sources. Then we have personal pronouns, which are uh, obviously we, me, myself, our, but what's interesting about these are that they show how the author refers to themselves within the paper. And finally, we have reporting verbs. These are verbs that writers use to describe other studies. Uh, for example, Proctor found significant effects, so here found would be the reporting verb. So going into the reporting verbs, we have three main types, and these are based off of Highland's 2002 study and methodology. So we have research acts which represent more of the real world verbs and research activities. So those are verbs like observe and analyze, as you see here. And then we have cognition acts, acts which represent the mental processes of the researcher and discourse acts, which represent the previous two uh, categories, but a verbal expression of those. So discuss, report, uh, points out, argue, those kind of verbs. And so here we have all of the categories, according to Highland, of each of these types of verbs. And generally, we have factive or positive, which show the writer's agreement with the cited material. We have critical, which show the author's, or sorry, the writer's disagreement with the material. And then a non-factive or more neutral category. So my research question in general was, does authorial stance vary across genres? And if so, what are the implications? And going into the methodology, I was able to use Bethany Gray's corpus. It is a state-of-the-art collaborative corpus that I was able to access with the help of Dr. Rollins. Uh, it's valued at around $12,000, so it was very fortunate that I was able to use that for free. Um, <laughs> and she was able to take art articles from four to seven journals of each of these six categories. And it's a large corpus of more than 200 articles. And I coded the introduction and literature review of each of those articles using Deduce, which is a, a research tool. Uh, and I coded each of the previous uh, elements of authorial stance that I mentioned. And I spent about 240 hours, or 240 plus hours coding these articles. And I'm still working on it, so these are just the pre preliminary results that we're going to get today. Um, again, like I mentioned before, I used the Highland methodology for defining reporting verbs. He did a similar study in 2002, but it was a very small study, um, only 80 articles total, and he used a corpus-based approach. Whereas, I used a more detailed and um, manual approach using deduce. I coded every single sentence and every single reporting verb and element of authorial stance by hand using this uh, program. On the right, you can see the codes, and on the left, you see the article. And I was able to, during uh, the methodology, make sure that I was uh, coding correctly and coding consistently using uh, the training model. So let's get into some of the charts and graphs that we have here. Uh, the first element that we're looking at is the citation form. And if you look here, you can see for yourself uh, the trends that are coming out of the preliminary results. So these numbers are a little bit confusing, but when you see a number, you divide it by 100, and that is the average number of times it would appear in an article, in the intro and liter literature review of an article. So for example, with biology, we have um, 1,323 instances, and that would be 1.3, on average, occurrences per article of non-integral uh, citations. And so here the trend is to use non-integral citations, especially in the quantitative, more quantitative fields. And then applied linguistics is using more of author as subject, which is interesting because um, it focuses more on the author driving the uh, narrative instead of the writer, as opposed to the, you can see in the um, hard sciences, uh, it's more of a non-integral approach where the writer is the focus. And here we have cited work. 
And if you look at the uh, data here, you can see it as well that most are using just summary and generalizations instead of um, any of the other ways to describe cited material or to use cited material. And um, there's almost not, no uh, cited material used word for word in the hard sciences. Then this slide is actually very interesting because as an undergraduate, I was taught that I wasn't supposed to use I in any formal academic writing. However, this data shows that across multiple disciplines, using the subject pronouns are actually very common. And you have, um, especially in philosophy, but in every single genre, you have usages of personal pronouns, um, and especially in the subject position. So it's not necessarily frowned upon, especially, uh, which is important to know, especially if you were taught that all growing up and through your undergraduate degree. And then we're gonna get into reporting verbs here. We have research acts, which uh, again, are those real world verbs. Um, they're more dealing with uh, the research processes. So we have applied linguistics is using far more reporting verbs than the other genres. But more interesting to me is the fact, or uh, what is not there. What we don't have here are the counterfactive verbs, which are the verbs that, um, excuse me, which are the verbs that are criticizing the cited material. And so those would be verbs like fail or misunderstood, and these people are steering away from that and instead are focusing on the neutral or more positive ways to cite their material. And then we have cognitive acts, which show that same trend of avoiding the critical verbs. And again, it's interesting here, as you can see, if you look at the data, you have history, um, has a lot more cognitive acts verbs than the implied linguistics. And that might have something to do with the qualitative, sorry, qualitative nature of the study. Then we have discourse acts, which are the uh, verbal expression of the previous two acts. So verbs like argue, point out, and again, we have applied linguistics with far more reporting verbs. But again, we see this trend of not using the critical verbs. So what does this all mean and why is it important? Basically, uh, if we can quantify this information, we can help uh, professional advisors uh, teach university students specifically in their field instead of making generalizations. And um, this data has actually been used by a BUE professor here, Grant Eckstein. He's using this data to teach his students uh, more specifically what academic writing entails for each of their specific subjects. And uh, in previous conferences, the data has been requested in order for people to uh, further their teaching and be able to help students understand what exactly uh, academic and formal writing looks like in their field. And for anyone who needs to communicate across disciplines like any future Nobel laureates, they would be able to use this information to be able to do that. Uh, one of the actual weaknesses that I not weaknesses, but one of the things I want to improve upon with this research is to also include a corpus-based approach in addition to the manual coding that I uh, <coughs> conducted. And I want to use uh, corpus analyzers like AntConc and part of speech taggers. Stanford Core NLP is a type of um, processor that would also help to analyze this data. And I would like to take this data and put it through machine learning so that it can learn what the codes are and then expand that uh, further. And also, obviously, uh, this is all things I'm going to do before the end of December, but I would like to do the statistical analysis as well to see the uh, significance. And I just wanted to thank all of the people who made this possible, all the contribution, uh, contributors that helped with this. It has been very fascinating. And I'm really excited to continue this and keep going with um, helping people to quantify academic writing. Thank you. Yes. I've got a question. I, this was a really interesting uh, presentation, uh, interesting findings. Mm -hmm. I was struck with how much applied linguistics and a lot of the same kinds of word usages you'd associate with 
uh, other humanities projects. And I say that's interesting because a lot of uh, linguists I know see their own discipline as being the science within the humanities, mm -hmm. right? So it really is, to me, it looked like a border discipline, somewhere between philosophy on the one end and biology on the other, but kind of tilting much more toward the humanities. Would you agree with that initial, this superficial assessment of mine? And if you do agree or disagree, do you find that interesting or meaningful in some way? I do agree, and it's interesting too because the applied linguistics had the most verbs in discourse acts as opposed to research acts, which I thought it would have more in research acts, but it had more in discourse, which is just that verbal expression of it. So I do agree with you that it's kind of, it is more quantifiable, however, it is kind of in between both of the, the two ends of that. So, yeah, thank you. And then I think we have over here. Yeah, I'm curious to know um, what the, the, in the body of like, articles that you were researching, what was sort of like the, the publication date? Like, was it like over like a lot of years that you were studying? Like, have these trends existed for a lot of years or has it like fluctuated? So it was always from 2001 and forward was the Bethany Grace Corpus, but um, I'm not sure to what date she goes. I believe it's 2009, uh, but I would have to double check on that for sure. And it would be interesting to continue this research with the machine learning that I want to do and the corpus analysis uh, with more recent articles. I don't, I think it's, yeah, I'm pretty sure it ends at 2009 and then uh, it would be interesting to continue that and see if there's more fluctuation. Yeah, thank you. Yes? So I was thinking about what you said with um, the general rules of writing. So we all know what they are and how you were surprised that a lot more nouns are used. Mm -hmm. um, do you uh, have, I guess, a goal in mind as part of your research of helping to maybe better writing in different academic fields so that both professors who are teaching that writing to their students or reviewing that writing and students who are submitting that writing actually know how to write in the quote-unquote style of their field? Yeah, for sure. So I actually, um, in the last conference that I presented at, people were asking for the data for the information to be able to give to their student, to be able to teach their students these concepts. And so that's part of it, to be able to distribute it that way. And then also, um, I'm planning on writing multiple papers on this. There's a, a lot of avenues that you can go with this information. So I'm planning on writing multiple papers that will kind of put that information out there. So I definitely hope that this has a practical use so that it helps uh, students learn what is actually being used in their field as opposed to maybe the more prescriptive standards that some teachers put upon their fields. So, yes, the short answer. Uh, I have a question here on Zoom. Um, you mentioned uh, that you were surprised by the amount of verbs in that Discord as opposed to research. Were there any other surprising results that once you, you know, put it all into the research tools, so any other things that you were just surprised by? Yeah, yeah for sure. For sure. And like I mentioned before as well, um, there were hardly any uses of critical verbs, which is the writer criticizing the cited material, and also the uh, counterfactive, which are uh, basically this, that's the same thing, but just in the research acts um, category. So I was surprised that nobody was really criticizing openly the, uh, their cited authors, um, I want to look more into that, and if that stays the same once I finish all of the coding, that would definitely be very interesting, uh, for sure. So that was the main other one that surprised me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Research, one of our own humanities center fellows, 
and my dear friend, Abby Thatcher. She's already introduced herself a little bit, but just to refresh your memory, she's a senior double majoring in interdisciplinary humanities um, and English with plans to enter graduate school next fall. She enjoys long walks around the pond with Thoreau, well watching with Melville, and the occasional swinging party with Fitzgerald, Zelda, not Scott. Her research interests include 19th century transatlantic literature, disability and freak studies critical theory, and the interplay between spectator and spectacle. Whenever she's not partying like it's 1886, she can be found working on a book of creative nonfiction that she may never finish, but finds therapeutic during the pandemic, nonetheless. So, please join me in welcoming Abby Thatcher. Perfect. Um, thanks, with, uh, thanks for bearing with us to the end of this symposium. It's been wonderful. Today I'll be presenting on Practically Genuine, Ventriloquism, Eugenics, and the Deforming Power of Editing within Hockey and Autobiography by Gangrel. Um, while I was in Glasgow, Scotland last year, I stumbled my way upon the Glasgow Rectory, pictured here on the left, that abuts the magnificent Glasgow Cathedral. In the upstairs gallery under a sloping roof, I discovered a collection of broadside and chapbook prints, cheap publications mass-produced and sold on the 19th century streets of Scotland. They depicted twisted bodies selling these chapbooks in Glasgow, and a small plaque to the side said that these people with disabilities would be captured in caricatures, local stories, and drawings, but then they would sell themselves for shillings apiece on the street. One featured figure in the rectory gallery pictured on the right was an author himself of two published broadsides um, from 1830 to 1841. His name was William Hockey Cameron, and he was variously described by contemporaries as the lame beggar, street orator, and wit. He was fondly remembered as a street hawker of these chapbooks. Cameron's letters, he penned letters to his personal friend, David Robertson, while an inmate at Glasgow's town hospital in the last 10 years of his life. And they were later compiled by editor John Strathisk after David Robertson's death in 1854. Uh, John Strathisk, an editor, published these, uh, these letters pulled together into a manuscript as Hockey, the Autobiography of a Gangrel in 1888. The work itself was sold for a shilling and received such warm reception that within 10 days of its publication, there was a call for a second edition. The book was purported by Strathisk to be practically a genuine reproduction of Hockey's original manuscript. However, in my project, I explored how Cameron Scott's voice is edited to the point of sterilization within the work, and how Strathisk manipulates the body of Cameron's text towards greater disability for his own rhetorical play and further for his own social agenda at the end of this uh, 19th century. My argument is most interested in editing's roles as bodies are formed, manipulated, and coerced within these 19th century literatures. Which tongue receives invisibility and which claims greatest presence is a question central to translation and editing studies. Which body, whether textual or actual, receives invisibility is a question central to disability studies. In my project, I sought to use all of these various critical approaches to understand what is at play in the treatment of Cameron's body of text. I argue towards editing in this instance as a tool of ventriloquism and puppetry, a mode of end of century eugenics in Victorian Scotland and is ultimately deforming. I seek to not paint Strathisk here as editor and a, a black-hearted villain, but it is productive to identify societal patterns within Strathisk's socially motivated editing and to investigate what marks were made upon the bodies of those who were socially edited out of sight and then further out of mind. First, it is important to recognize what Strathus claimed of the text's origination and of his role in its unique production. Strathus' name appears as editor on the title page of the work, pictured here on the left, with no reference to William Cameron as author. Instead, Cameron is hidden behind hockey as gangrel. The term gangrel, somewhat negatively connotated, 
means here vagabond or tramp, but at the end of the 19th century would have been most associated with beggar in a very negative sense. Upon the title page, only Strathic's name is printed. Within the preface, Strathic introduced Cameron as Elias Hockey, beggar, street orator, and wit. For despite his inveterate love of the dram and his furnishing in other respects a living illustration of Burns' line, Nifiva can we fall, his biting sarcasm, reckless wit, and snell hits made him a general favorite. Framing Cameron as first a beggar, and second as an inveterate drunk who could not fall further, Strathus renders his source author as seemingly needful of rescue, if not from his own tongue as yet, then certainly from the dram. Strathus continues by saying that the work is as literal a copy as could be taken from the original manuscript, the genuine production of Hockey's own hand and brain. And that aside from, quote, some change in spelling, etc., necessary for the comfort of the reader, and some spicy bits here and there, the emphasis in the original, the book is practically a genuine reproduction of Hockey's original manuscript. At no point does Strathus claim extensive editing, substantial revisions, or impose chronological structure, and yet that is what one must suppose happened between Cameron's original text and the stylistic other that Strathus words create in comparison. Strathus' inclusion of some of Cameron's unedited letters at the end of the edition give a point of comparison between Cameron's style and language and Strathus. Cameron wrote phonetically, in a mixture of Scots and early 19th century English that speaks to his extensive travels across Scotland and Northern England during his lifetime. In March of 1842, Cameron wrote as a postscript to a letter to, again, his friend David Robertson, No farther with my pen I'll win, take pity on a pit that's time, for ardent spirits this place keeps free, to total's home, elite its name be. Further, Cameron also writes of his creative conditions while penning his work at the Glasgow Town Hospital, and says, I have now 30 subjects new to the world, but I have only completed 13 page of paper, as my desk is the bottom of a window and right standing on the left foot. When read aloud, even by my poor um, pronunciation, the misspelling of Cameron's words are meaningful and useful. By making the language his own and spelling as he speaks phonetically with all the rhythm and cadence of his own, he shaped the language in his turn, and we are able to hear Cameron, the author, and his voice. Strathus argues in his preface that changes in the spelling were necessary, that the language itself was flawed, but that the text still has a pure ring of hockey about it. Certainly, it is unrealistic to expect a text riddled with divergent spelling to be published in 1888. Correction of spelling, mechanics, and grammar is the traditional role of an editor. But Strathus' changes upon Cameron's style seem to go beyond the correction of mere divergent spellings. I will demonstrate this through a quick analysis of his preface, which frames the work for Strathus' ends. Strathus seeks in his deliberate editing and translation to adapt the work to a different audience in order to influence the way an audience reads the work. He wishes that all who read will be convinced of, quote, the great evils of promiscuous almsgiving, sometimes miscalled charity. More specifically, just as Strathus cast Cameron as a drunk, continually seeking, quote, a morsel of that dratted tobacco, close quote, Strassus frames the entirety of Cameron's autobiography with two pointed epigraphs that paint disability as a lie to gain money to support sin. The first, that appears before his preface, is a selection from songwriter Charles Gray and paints a gangrel on his timber pegs as daily begging and nightly rejoicing, dancing on two good legs and whistling over the law of it. This is followed closely by an excerpt from Robert Burns' The Jolly Beggars, a cantata that Burns wrote, in which Pussy Nancy, the odd bearded woman manning the hearth in the cottage full of, quote, randy gangrel bodies, provides splore, moonshine whiskey, or the dram, for all the merry corps of beggars that frolic on Saturday night and beg on Monday morning. The Jolly Beggars seems to be the text to convince audiences of the fakery of beggars in Scotland during this time. In the Chambers Edinburgh Journal in February of 1832, William Chambers' critical essay on the Jolly Beggars speaks disparagingly of the disabled poor who gather within Burns' poem at Pusey Nancy's Cottage. He describes the vulgar throng gathering on Saturday night experiencing miracles wrought by Pusey's wonderful fire or the whiskey. Here, the, visible, the miserable wretch who perished with the rheumatism and walked double through the week was cured in an instant, as if the demon of the disease had fled from his bones on coming within the influence of a spell. The poor old blind man who has held forth the terrible circumstances of his condition, 
vexing the ears of the legions for six long days, suddenly opened his eyes to the blessings before him as if he had only awoke from a long sleep. The poor sailor lad, too, who had lost an arm with Rodney, seemed suddenly to forget all the effects of the engagement, and in the twinkling of a band spike, the long-deceased limb sprang from the jacket into all its pristine health and vigor. Such was the literary criticism of the day, interpreting the jolly beggars as all fakes, mining disability and then casting it off in favor of their vulgar vices, and seeking money from the virtuous to prop up their, quote, empty wallets, sore heads, and sneaking aspects, close quote. This was not a reading performed by Chambers alone, as the poem was inspired by Robert Burns's own experience looking in on a gathering of the disabled in Mochland, Scotland. Burns then translated the scene he saw into a cantata of the, quote, ruins of humanity, close quote. The issue of translating disability as performed for profit, and then profiting for the sake of vice alone, begins with poetry that interprets or translates disability as vulgar and false, then literary criticism that perpetuates such prejudice, then finally with autobiographies of the disabled that are edited by the able-bodied to support warnings against the moral failings of the disabled existence. Strathis' editing demonstrates this physical construction of enclosed rhetorical and social spaces that construct disability and the sinfully fallen other. Through Strathis' editing, Cameron's voice takes on an old-fashioned pandanticism and an impressive self-reflection on his own moral failings. So here, when I arrived at the age of 30, having come through the sictitudes and miseries that the world never did, nor shall hear of, and seeing no possibility of ever redeeming myself, I then let slip the spirit that till then I had preserved and faced a stormy world with a company of wanderers whose professions were below the dignity of manhood and whose conditions were below the level of common beggars. Dramatically different in tone and style than Cameron's words in his letters, Cameron is painted as despairing of personal vice, but unable to overcome his weakness, leaving him in the company of wanderers who were below the dignity of manhood, so similar to the ruins of humanities described by Chambers and by Robert Burns. Strathus, as editor, becomes another apparatus of normalizing and disabling power. He translates the experiences of Cameron's disability, including expanding his disability from lameness of leg to a further lameness of character and moral propriety, for the able-bodied and more morally outstanding of the Scottish people. His editing of Cameron's body of text further deforms public perception of disability and ability to make sure they do not give that horrid thing charity. What then are the political implications of Strathic's editing and manipulation of Cameron's literary body of text, both within and without the world of William Cameron in his autobiography? One, if to gain solidarity, one must understand the mother tongue, Strathus has cut off at the knees any hope for solidarity or empathy to develop, for he has removed the mother tongue and left behind only its scar tissue, moments when Cameron speaks, but only in short snippets, garbled by parentheses and quotation marks. There's a quite literal invasion of his body of text by Strathus as editor. Two, Strathus' deforming translation has hobbled Cameron for any possibility for inclusion in a canon of truly good writing, full participation in the authorial conversation of chapbook production, or acknowledgement in the group of writers who published or wrote in Scots. Certainly here a question of whether Cameron had a chance for such inclusion to begin with is valid. His letters do not seem to hold the literary genius of Carlyle, Byron, or other contemporary authors. However, the real issue is that Cameron's work never had the chance to be deemed unworthy on the merits or faults of his writing alone. Instead, Strathus claimed Cameron's voice deficient from the beginning of his unauthorized project on grounds of degenerate body and spirit, not upon Cameron's lack of literary vision or talent. By editing, and thereby eliminating Cameron's true voice based on judging bodies fit or unfit, Strathus neuters Cameron's ability to be reproduced himself. Authors cannot imitate a style when it has been so thoroughly transformed. And therefore, Strathus sterilizes a disabled voice and further does so without his consent, raising grim parallels towards eugenic practices of court-mandated and forced sterilization of the disabled and other minority groups. Sterilizing Cameron's voice and thereby controlling his textual reproduction manifests late 19th century post-Darwinianism social anxiety. Herbert Spencer's argument pushed for society to cease propping up the weak by giving charity. It was Spencer, not Darwin, who coined the expression survival of the fittest. Robert Knox's 1850 book, The Races of Man, stratified human beings according to race and ability, including that of able-bodied or disabled. 
Francis Galton's Hereditary Genius, published in 1869, built upon both Spencer's and Knox's works as he advocated for rational, not natural selection, and the practice of eugenics, a new term meaning well-born. In action, Galton pushed for skilled professionals to manage the reproduction of the feeble-minded. For him, that included paupers, alcoholics, women on poor relief, and the disabled. The translation of bodies into categories such as the feeble-minded and well-born seems, at least in Cameron's case, to have led into textual reproduction. Strathus, the skilled professional, wields a double-edged sword. One, by objectifying the disabled, paupered, and alcoholic Cameron source text as one capable of pushing survival of the fittest cessation of giving charity, he turns Cameron's body into an example of and a sermon against the weak. Two, by sterilizing Cameron's voice, making it unable to ever be effectively reproduced, and further, completely controlling the birth of Cameron's textual production, Cameron's style, voice, and unique perspective are quite literally kept away from the canon gene pool of the strong deemed worthy enough to be passed along. Here, questions of gene editing, splicing, 21st century questions of ethical practice in genetic manipulation, perhaps by one of their source texts, but also an interesting ground for further research. The manipulated voice of Cameron sits as a ventriloquist dummy upon Strathus' lap and is forced to champion the death of the practice, almsgiving and charity, that gave him much needed aid in life. Even with the manipulation Cameron's voice and textual body undergoes in death, Cameron's words still manage to assert themselves to a point. His voice still requires for the modern reader clarification, unpacking, and a certain amount of room to breathe. His body in the hands of Strathus may be continually deformed, but it is his language which resists complete domestication of translation or of editing. Perhaps the time has come for the reader as empathetic translator to move towards these marginalized voices, bringing down false barriers and uncovering lost voices, such as William Cameron, beggar, street orator, wit, and not to be forgotten author. Thank you. Fascinating project. But you've got to love the, the Glasgow Cathedral yeah. with the necropolis right over the top of it, right? It's fantastic. It's a great place to find a text like this. I wonder if you could just talk a bit more about this idea of the eugenicized gangrel. I'm, I'm struck, you know, with um, uh, the, 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 the dance you've got to play if you're Strathisk. You know, on the one hand, you've got to sort of illustrate a thing which cannot should not be seen, it's, 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 it's vulgar, it's beyond vulgar, it's low, it's monstrous on the one hand. On the other hand, it must be seen, it looks like a version of like, uh, you know, sort of Freudian unconscious censorship in advance, right? So it's somewhere between the Gothic and Freudian psychoanalysis to the text right like this. And I'm wondering if you thought really about, about the, 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 the editorial and aesthetic imperative, what it means to try to portray the unacceptable to only those readers who are deemed acceptable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so my research really started with trying to understand how these, um, these very public, very visible people in society. I mean, in Glasgow, they have, there's other texts that you could read. I read this for my project, including Peter Mackenzie's Glasgow Characters. Um, immensely popular, they did several reprintings that were these um, really well-loved and very familiar figures that would stand on the street corners of Glasgow and would be the ones to sell you your morning paper or to provide political commentary and were really just there. You were very aware of them as people, but again, there is this tension of, I can't acknowledge them, but they are there. They continually assert themselves in the same way that Cameron's voice asserts himself eventually in the text. He can't be ignored. Um, and so there is a tension there between our ability to perhaps aestheticize for um, consumption and for ease of consumption for these readers. And this is actually where translation studies um, really help me give a, a better lens to this because there's two different types of translation. You can either have domesticizing translation or foreignizing. And so what Strathus ends up doing, um, I argue, is actually a form of domesticizing translation. He makes Cameron palatable. And in making him palatable, he erases much of what makes Cameron human, 
Um, and then further, he, he takes Cameron and manipulates him into a space that suits the able-bodied. And that's where that, that danger is. And that's ultimately what the danger is in translation studies between domesticizing and, and foreignizing translation. And so I it definitely, it's an ongoing project for me to try to think through these questions. And so I'm grateful for that one. And I, yeah, still pondering. <laughs> yes, for now. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, I was hoping to answer some of them myself by traveling to, um, to archives in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, a lot of these texts and these broadsides and chapbooks are not digitized. They don't receive a lot of attention because often they're the tabloid literatures of the day. And so these are not things that you would keep around or think to do much other than throw into the bin. And so um, they actually, there's a lot of confusion, and that's why in my paper I put unauthorized in quotations, <laughs> um, because it's a guess for me. I'm not quite sure how David Strath or how John Strathus ended up with this text. It is clear that uh, William Cameron did not intend, he never explicitly said, that these letters that he penned and these various pictures of the world that he had pulled together within the um, Glasgow Town Hospital he never intended for them to be published to a wide audience. Um, he very clearly had permission for two other chapbooks to be published, but because he was disabled, we actually struggled to find entire pieces of the chapbooks that he wrote. One of them was titled Hockey the Cow, um, and it's a, sh it's a challenge to find much of anything. And so it does go into this question of how are we valuing voices, both when they